Good morning. Good morning. I'm out of breath. <laughs> oh, but it's a joy to be with you today and to share in the life and the fellowship and the service of Kings Grant Baptist Church because I know I'm with people that know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, there's a good spirit here at Kings Grant, and it's the spirit of the Lord that's evident in your presence. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 John, chapter 1. Okay, 1 John, chapter 1. I'm going to read this passage again. You may have heard it already this morning, but uh, everything I'm going to tell you is based on this passage. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we've looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The secret to the Christian life is found in this passage of scripture. This is one of the most important teachings in all of God's word on how those who know Christ and believe in God are to live their lives. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So the question really is, how did Jesus live and conduct his life when he was here on earth in relationship to and with his heavenly Father? Because the kind of relationship he had with his Father while he lived those 33 and a half years on this earth is to be the pattern, the model, the way that you and I who believe in him, who receive him, trust in him, and seek to know him are to live out our lives. So what was the relationship between the Father and the Son when Christ lived on this earth. First of all, was the way he accepted, affirmed, and believed the scriptures, the word of God. In fact, John thought this was so important. John the apostle that he began his gospel saying, in the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him there was nothing made that has been made. Everything that exists owes its existence and reality to God and to Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come into this world in order to promulgate his own ideas. He came to say and to do what his father had told him and taught him to say and do. He accepted the scriptures as the word of God because it was his father who had designed, worked out, and put it all together. So much so that when Moses wrote and the prophets wrote down the words on papyrus or paper, they were writing nothing less than the very thoughts, words, and truth of God. The scriptures are not the product of human genius and ingenuity. They didn't take the finest, noblest thoughts that human beings could come up with and ascribe it to God. That's not what the scriptures are. The scriptures are nothing more or less than the word and words of God. They have authority for our lives, for our thoughts, for our behavior, for our relationships, for the living out and the conduct and expression of our lives on this earth. And that's exactly how Jesus Christ lived his life. He tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, don't think for a moment that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abdicate, eliminate, or get rid of the scriptures. No, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill, is what he said. In other words, the whole purpose, the whole focus of his life was to bring to fulfillment consummation and completion, the Word of God. I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 10 just for a moment. Tenth chapter of John's Gospel. An amazing portion of Scripture. I want to begin with verse 34 in John 10. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's. He's quoting from the scriptures. If he called them God's to whom the word of God came, and then he drops in this little personal comment about what he's just read, and the scripture cannot be broken. Scripture cannot be broken. It bears an authority. It has an integrity. There is a veracity, an honesty, a truthfulness to the scriptures that cannot be said of any other writings any other religious writings, philosophical writings, educational writings, scientific writings. Scriptures are true, and they cannot be broken. When he prayed for his disciples, John chapter 17, he prayed to his father and he said, Father, sanctify them, set them apart, make them holy by the truth. 
Your word is truth. It's amazing how many people want to claim to be Christian, call themselves and consider themselves followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, and yet feel free to have a very cavalier and casual attitude towards Scripture. Can't do that. If Jesus Christ is the Son of God, very God of very God and very Lord of very Lords, then his attitude towards Scripture must be ours. I can't say that I'm right and he's wrong. I can't say that society's right and he's wrong. When Scripture speaks, it speaks with integrity, honesty, and veracity. Your word is true. Scriptures cannot be broken. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to bring it to pass, to make it last. That's the way he lived his life. That's the way he conducted his life. His attitude and his spirit toward the scriptures must be ours. That's why in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How do we walk in the light? And the answer is by affirming, accepting, believing, submitting, and obeying Scripture. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. God is light, and in him is no darkness, no imperfection, nothing evil, nothing bad, nothing wrong, always true, always good, always perfect. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How do you begin to live that kind of life? And the answer is by accepting, receiving, believing, and living according to the teaching precepts and principles of God's Word. But there's another dimension to the relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus made this statement. He said, I and my Father are one. I'm in him, and he's in me. And I always do those things that please my Father. I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. My meat, that which gives strength, substance, substance and vitality to my life, is to do the will of God. Let me ask you a very personal question. Don't answer out loud. Just answer in the privacy of your own mind and heart. Have you ever given Jesus Christ the freedom and the liberty to tell you what to do, where to go, and how to live? If any man would be my disciple, he said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus, at some point in eternity past, gave the Father the right to tell him what to do with his life. It was in response to his father, that he agreed to set aside, lay aside, freely, volitionally, voluntarily, the full manifestation of his deity and his glory, be conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, 
come into this world and live for 33 years going where the Father wanted them to go, saying what the Father asked him to say, doing what the Father showed him to do. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one. The key to believers, Christians, getting along with one another, sharing life and fellowship together in the church of Jesus Christ, is coming to a point and place where each of us give Jesus Christ the right, the freedom, and the liberty to take over our lives and tell us how to live, where to go, what to do. And if we don't do that, Remember this, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father. Do you want God's will in your life? I mean, really. Do you want to experience the peace of God, <laughs> the love of God, the grace of God, the joy of God, the life of God? He that hath the Son of God has life. And he that has not the Son of God doesn't have it. And being a Christian is more than walking an aisle, shaking a preacher's hand, and joining a church. It's more than going through the waters of baptism. It's coming to a point and place in our life where we submit and surrender our lives to him and say, Lord, I can't do anything in myself apart from you and your grace. I want you to take over the control and the leadership of my life. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be by your grace. <laughs> that is not something we can do perfectly or rightly or fully, even after we're saved. But that has to be the heart's attitude. It has to be the spirit and the focus and the direction of our life. If we choose to resist him, to reject him, to ignore him or refuse him, that leadership and lordship role over our lives and our hearts. He has the right to say, I don't know you. You don't belong to me. But remember that night as he prayed in the garden, Lord, if it be possible, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, this cup of suffering, this cup of pain, this cup of death, this cup of rejection. Oh, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He that holds on to his life loses it, and he that loses his life for my sake finds it. That doesn't make sense, humanly speaking, but it makes perfectly good sense, spiritually speaking. And then finally, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ went about doing good. He said things like this. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, for the night comes when no man can work. What, what did he do that was so good? Well, you know. He fed people who were hungry. He healed people who were sick. He brought deliverance to those who were oppressed by the evil one. 
He spent time with publicans and sinners and prostitutes. He did good things. He cared for the disenfranchised, the broken, the discarded, the rejected. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. If any man would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, live like me, walk like me. Do any of us do it perfectly? The answer is no. Not in this world, in this body. But that's the direction. That's the object. That's the focus. And if we walk like that, then we have fellowship with one another. We enjoy getting together with one another. Imagine a church full of people. Just suppose for a minute that every single member and participant in the life of Kings Grant Baptist Church here in Virginia Beach were learning to walk and committed to live like Jesus Christ lived his life. Obeying the scriptures, submitting to God's will, and doing God's work. Roll up your sleeves. Get your hands dirty. Find a need and do something to the best of your ability to meet that need. Teach, work, serve, help, heal, care. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved to do good works. God's prepared for us to do. I want to tell you, it'll transform an individual's life. It'll transform a church's life. It'll transform a world that desperately needs the healing, helping, caring, loving touch of someone who knows Jesus Christ as Lord. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to recognize who Jesus is, why he came, and how he asks us and invites us to live our lives in union together with him through his spirit. Lord, if there's anyone here today who needs to make a new, clear, genuine and authentic commitment to you. Give you the right to live in and through them, to speak in and through them, to share in and through them, to love in and through them. Because that's the way you live, Lord. I ask that you would reveal that to them and give them the courage to make that choice and that commitment today. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.